Well, the new low-cost chips for Intel's Coffee Lake uh, CPUs are out. The new low-cost chipset, I should say. Um, everybody remember this diagram from WFCC Tech, where it's like, oh, this is all going to happen simultaneously. The low-cost chipset and the higher-cost Z370 overclocking chipset is going to launch at the same time at the beginning of 2018. Well, that didn't happen. We didn't get the lower-cost chipsets until April 2018. So, yeah. <laughs> this was originally going to be launched January 1st, but here it is. The non-overclocking mainstream chipset. So this motherboard is designed for CPUs that don't end in K. So for example, you can run the Intel i7-8700 six core in this motherboard at 4.3 gigahertz all day long. In fact, it'll turbo up to think 4.5 gigahertz, at least my 8700, that's what it does, the non-K 8700. So yeah, 4.3 all cores, all six cores, and 4.5 on, on like one core, hey, maybe two cores. That's what mine does, it works pretty well. No overclocking on the motherboard support means cost savings, $50 to $100 on your board. Uh, Intel launched non-K overclocking CPUs in late 2017, but you had to buy that more expensive Z370 chipset based motherboard because nothing else was available. Um, that kind of sucked if you didn't plan to overclock. I mean, if you were buying the 8700 or the i5 that are the non-K parts, the parts that don't end with a K, you weren't planning to overclock, you had to buy the more expensive motherboard. Well, now, lower cost boards like the Aorus Gaming 3 Wi-Fi are entering the market. Now, I'll also mention there's also the B360 and H310 chipsets. These chipsets, these three chipsets, are aimed uh, at lower cost motherboards, and the B360 and the H310 are aimed at even lower cost motherboards than the H370. And they have less PCI Express lanes and uh, USB connectivity as, a, as the cost saving measure there. The best applications for these boards are for people that don't plan to overclock. Especially if you're looking at, you know, say the i5 CPU, it's a six core, six thread, it doesn't do hyper threading. That combined with a less expensive motherboard is a really, really good value. Now back to this board, what do I get for peripheral connectivity on the H370? It's a pretty good mix of USB and PCI Express that's fine for most people, I think, as it turns out. It sports two USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports at the back, one type A and one type C. It also has an additional uh, four USB 2.0 ports and two USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports. Those are the blue ones. While we're back here, we can also call attention to the combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port, DVI and HDMI for the iGPU that's built directly into your CPU. Uh, there's also an analog 7.1 channel audio system as well as Intel Gigabit Ethernet. Now the biggest connectivity limitation on this board is that you've only got the one PCI Express by 16 slot that's wired directly into the CPU. It's always PCI Express by 16 on just about every Z370 motherboard, although not all you're getting your PCI Express by 16 slot can be split in terms of uh, connectivity to the CPU with by eight by eight lanes, meaning so that you've got two peripherals that can talk directly to the CPU, and that's great because there's no, there's no bottleneck. On this motherboard, all of the PCIe functions go through the chipset. So there are four PCI Express by one slots and one other armored reinforced by 16 slot that is hardwired to PCI Express by four. So that means no SLI on this motherboard, only the primary by 16 slot is actually wired into the CPU. And remember, all of this onboard M.2 uh, ultimately goes through the chipset to get to the CPU. So things like NVMe RAID uh, just doesn't make sense. Really, not just this motherboard, really the in Intel platform in general, even if you go all the way up to X299. And the reason for that is because all of that M.2 connectivity goes through the chipset and the chipset only has a total of PCI Express by four uh, connectivity. So about 32 gigabit per second or 40 gigabits per second if you're counting overhead, and literally everything. So if you've got faster M.2, M.2 RAID on this platform really doesn't make sense. And that's okay because the middle one here actually is even wired to PCI Express by two. It's only, it's only got two PCI Express 3.0 lanes. Uh, that, that means it can be paired with something like Optane which is only PCI Express by two anyway. And finally, the last one is a smaller one. It's, you know, physically it's not very long, but it's really meant to be paired with the bundled Wi-Fi adapter, which is a new thing called CNVI. Uh, CNVI is a new tech. In a nutshell, it's specialized hardware architecture that moves some of the networking uh, functionality from the wireless card directly onto the CPU. Now, the cool thing about CNVI is that it reduces the cost of the components involved because you don't have to reinvent a network card 
on an external add-in card, you can have that live on the CPU and just doing it all at CPU build time is easier than adding it on a module. Really the only thing that's on the CNVI card is your Bluetooth radio and your Wi-Fi radio. All of the other networking bits move to the CPU. So that reduces the cost for the wireless card makers, which is cool. Uh, and it also means that the CPU can deal with the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth stack, which is maybe better from a driver standpoint when you think about it. So it is bundled with the appropriate CNVI card from Intel, because it it's an Intel thing that we're dealing with here. I do want to compliment Gigabyte on the placement of the primary M.2 as well. It's just above the graphics card and below the CPU, which is really the best possible place that you could put the M.2 in terms of airflow. And that M.2 does have the full PCI Express 3.0 by 4 connection, so good job, Gigabyte. Being a value board, there's not really a lot that you get in the box. You get the manual, you get the I.O. slot cover, you get the aforementioned CNVI Intel wireless card with an expansion slot breakout adapter. You get a nice set of antennas. Look, not rubber duck antennas. That's one of my big complaints when motherboards come with antennas. This type of antenna where you can move it around is a really, really good deal versus the antennas that just screw in the back of the case. Because if the antenna is not really getting good signal behind your computer, and hint, your metal case in your computer is going to block signal. This is a much, much better setup if you are in the unfortunate position of having to use wireless for your desktop machine. You got the Gigabyte G connector, which makes hooking your front panel wires up a little easier. You got the driver and manual CD, two SATA 6 gig gigabit per second cables, the Gigabyte case badge, and some FCC information about your wireless module, and some M.2 mounting accessories. As for other connectivity, well, you do get six 6 gigabit per second SATA ports, front panel USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type C two USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type-A, that's the standard 30-pin connector, an extra USB 2.0 header, so you get even more USB 2.0 ports if you need it, RS-232 serial, Thunderbolt, and four LED headers, two analog, two digital. The LED headers that are analog are for RGBW strips, so if you wanna use RGBW strips, you totally can do that. There are a total of five four-pin fan headers on this motherboard, including two that are linked for CPU cooling, so you have CPU primary and CPU opt. They're colored and they're conveniently located. Now, even though Intel says that the non-K parts have a TDP of 65 watts, that's crazy. You shouldn't assume that the CPU is only gonna consume 65 watts because that's just not even in this, true in this universe, in this realm of reality. So this motherboard has a pretty beefy eight plus two power phase design, which is actually really good for the non-overclocking CPUs. Who knows, maybe that WFCC article that we saw earlier was right, and we're gonna see eight core CPUs on this socket pretty soon. That would explain the, uh, the over-engineering of the uh, VRM component on this particular motherboard. Of course, 4.3 gigahertz on six cores on a Coffee Lake on a non-K CPU, uh, you, gotta, you gotta work pretty hard to keep that cool. So be sure that you get a beefy cooler if that's something that you're gonna build. It also has four DDR4 DIMM slots, which is something else to look out for. Lower cost boards might omit two of those slots to save a few bucks, and uh, you're, you'll want all four slots if you upgrade your, your memory later. As for Linux testing, well, this is a pretty solid board if you don't need multiple PCIe slots and peripherals that are wired directly into the CPU. So if you're running like a video capture card in a single NVMe, it's totally fine in this motherboard if you wanted to run two graphics cards. That's gonna be pushing it a little bit more. You're gonna be more on the AMD side than NVIDIA because that secondary graphics card is gonna be connected through the chipset and it might potentially bottleneck if you're pairing that with high-speed peripherals like NVMe. But this motherboard does have plenty of connectivity for ordinary use cases, especially if you're not planning to overclock. It's worth looking at. Uh, even building a higher-end system with a non-overclocking i7 and a high-end NVMe and a good graphics card would work great with this motherboard. So, I, I, you know, it's really, I really can't fault it. It's pretty well put together, and I think that this is perfectly fine for most people. I really wish that Intel had released the chipset, so Gigabyte, so Aorus, we could have had this motherboard at the beginning of 2018. But hey, it's April, and if you're looking for a deal, this is gonna be pretty good. If you decide to pick up one of these, or you do a build with one of these, uh, show it off in pictures at the Level 1 forums. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.